Hello, Austin. Welcome, everyone, to the event, the second day. First of all, I'm excited to be here. Thank you all to, you know, for inviting me out here, Brent, the entire um, big commerce and feed economics management team. Fantastic event. There are a lot of themes I'll be talking about today. And we're in an interesting world, world where there's a lot of uncertainty. Uncertainty creates confusion, it creates worry, but I think to those paying attention, it also creates a lot of opportunity. And I think to the folks that are in the audience and including big commerce at the same time, those that are paying attention to the right signals are able to take advantage of this opportunity. So when Sharon and the big commerce team and Feedonomics talked to me earlier this year about working on a white paper with them based on some research done by Rick Kenny and his uh, amazing team. The idea kind of came to us, your customer is hiding in plain sight. I don't care what market you go to around the world, 50, 60, 70, sometimes 80% of all commerce in any market, it's on marketplaces. You see the customers are there, you know it. Direct to consumer. Great channel, you need it. Wholesale, great channel, you need it. But marketplaces have one thing, especially as a new and upcoming brand, that you don't have when you're starting out. And that thing is trust. There is a reason you go on Amazon, you buy something from someone with seven consonants and two vowels, with 20 million reviews, and it shows up in your house tomorrow because it just freaking works. And that trust is created by consistent quality experiences over time. And that consistent quality experience is your brand. And I think brands that understand that, that you, your experience is your marketing, really able to thrive. So you guys know me, that's why you're here, maybe. Some of the things we'll talk about today, um, we'll talk about the research, um, the items that we uncovered. We'll talk about some industry trends that I've been seeing that I think are relevant to the folks that are in this room. Then finally, we'll have Travis and um, Sharon up here for a little fireside chat. Just intimate, just the three of us and a whole room full of people. Um, you guys will be able to ask questions at the end of it, so we're excited about that. So let's get started. In the feed game, there are only a few things that you need to think about. You're going to have to pay the middleman. Death taxes, you know, death, maybe hopefully you don't get yanked off of the sites, but Taxes, you're going to have to pay the tax man, that's for sure, whether it's in seller fees or advertising or both for most of us. But then optimization. I always found one of my things I say a lot about the marketplace business, which I've been in for like, what, 25 years at this point, going back to 99. Um, doing business on marketplaces is like a knife fight in a phone booth. Your competitors are all at the same place at the same time, trying to own the same keywords and the same PDPs. And everything you do is very much out in the open. If you're not shipping on time, if your product is not very good, it's not like your website where like, oh, I got a three-star review. Let me delay publishing that review a little bit uh, so that my customer doesn't see it. Marketplace, ah, you don't have that option. Everything's out in the open. And so, Optimizing your marketplace business is definitely something that you always think about. And the reason is pretty simple. That's where your consumer is. And previously, consumer had really two choices you know, in the past 20 years. Walk into a store or go to your website. Those were the two choices. And the website was kind of like the brand showcase you're going to use it, you're going to see full price product there, but kind of the notion of even like 15 years ago, D2C wasn't kind of a thing. You were still 
commerce was still done in stores. The rise of marketplaces has really given birth to a third place where consumers are that are experiencing your brand. And even the largest company in the world have tried to hold back the tide of a marketplace for a long time and have ultimately given up. Nike, when it finally gets its act together next year, they're going to be back on Amazon like they should have been four years ago when they made that initial mistake not to have Nike shoes on Amazon. The idea is that more than half of your consumers are using four, five, and six places to find you. They might see an influencer using your product. They're going to search on Amazon to see if you're there, how quickly they can get it. They'll go back to your site to learn a little bit more about your brand. If you're in Nordstrom, Target, Walmart, wherever you are, they can look at your product, try it on, hold it. All these things are part of consideration. Not only consideration, but awareness too. If you're not all these places and your competitors are, then you're at a disadvantage. And so by expanding to three or more channels, as a brand, one of the things we uncovered is that you can boost your order rate substantially. And in marketplaces, you know, one of the benefits of being in the space for a long time is you learn to categorize, like, what is this thing about? And for our research that we publish in the white paper that you can download, we have a, a, a link at the end of the talk, there are really only five major challenges that you're trying to solve. Just five simple challenges. Follow me. One is identification. What channels to go on? This is actually somewhat the easy part. Everyone can go on the list and see, like, here are the top websites, Amazon, Walmart, Timu, Shein, TikTok. Is it real? Is it not real? You at least know the names to talk to versus the name maybe you haven't quite heard of. That maybe should be further down your list. Connectivity is also something like in the age of APIs has started to become more and more table stakes. 20 years ago, it was a lot harder. Now. It's hard because there are so many channels that you need to do, and, and maintaining all those connections is hard. It's not because an individual channel by itself is hard. You know, of course, except when they break your APIs on you. Next is assortment. And this is something that a lot of brands talk about in their four walls, but it's not really talked about in the industry as much. Meaning, you're not just blasting, you know, except maybe on Google product search. You're not really blasting your product to every channel all the time. And the reason is pretty simple. As you get down to the next point, profitability, your profitability profile of your channel is very different based on, does that consumer know you? Is it a new SKU you're launching, or is it an older SKU? Do you have to advertise it? Or is it later and more mature in the life cycle? Is it something that's on a marketplace you need to take off because it's hurting your profitability? All these things have to do with assortment. And if I'm going to introduce myself to a new consumer, which is really the number one reason why anyone goes on a marketplace is to introduce themselves to a consumer that doesn't know them. And if your competitor is there and you're not there, and if your products that are, I would call your opener products, like if someone's going to try your brand, what are the 10 best ways to do that? Those products for sure should be on Marketplace. And then your, your bundle, your profitable products can be there. Your full line assortment, exclusive assortment, can still be on your website. But that assortment challenge is something thinking through as you get on a Marketplace. Profitability is another huge concern. <clears throat> sort of very well published industry stats. I would say between 30 and 50% of revenue is taking up in expenses being on a marketplace, much less later in the life cycle as you have reviews and earned media and, and credibility. Earlier on, if you're going to break into a category that has 60% paid listings on the front page, and you're not spending at least 30% of your revenue on advertising, like, might as well not launch the product, guys. <laughs> you're not going to show up. So advertising is a huge part of that, but also profitability. Amazon has made it harder, you know, and other channels have made it harder to become profitable. And as a result, sellers really need to be on their P's and Q's understanding 
Where do I have leverage? Where do I have not? What's the long game here? I'm not playing from launch month one. I'm not trying to be profitable in month two. Month two. Because if you're not investing into the channel, similar to your direct-to-consumer site, wasn't profitable month one. And if <clears throat> you have to think about your marketplace business the same way. And then finally, optimization. Once you're there <clears throat> and you can understand your profitability, optimization takes a few different forms. Title, imagery. First of all, it's getting noticed. Are you in all the places, the big tentpole events in the year, the prime day and the deal days that are coming up in October very soon. Um, also, are you showing up on the first page? Are people clicking through? That's the first problem you need to solve. Then you could solve the PDP problem, meaning your product detail page. Can people swipe through the imagery very easily? Do you have videos? Do you have infographics that show people not just the, the capabilities of your products, but the features and benefits that make sense to the consumer in the context of their lives? And I think that is something that's sometimes very different from an imagery point of view on a marketplace versus on your own website. All these things are part of optimization. A plus content pages, extra details about your brand, making sure you're participating in reviews programs or you're on. All these things are optimization. All these things take a lot of time. Do you have the right bullets? And having a great partner like Feedonomics can really help you make sure that happens in the best way possible. So these are the topics that are part of the white paper. We'll definitely post the link after, but it outlines all these challenges, why it matters, what to do about it. So we're excited to be able to share this with you today. Now we'll move on to more, I would say, current industry trends. And there are kind of three that I really want to talk to you about today. And if you follow me or are interested in anything I have to say in the past year, you will recognize definitely some of these things. Cheap consumer, rise in social shopping, and then margin compression. The economy, as I said in the opening, is somewhat uncertain. And people are trying to figure out what's happening with the consumer. I heard on CNBC, there's no inflation anymore. I'm like, seriously, there's no inflation anymore? The same thing I bought three years ago was like 50% more, and this guy on TV is telling me there's no inflation anymore? Those, I would say there are two types of people in the economy to listen to. Number one is the investors who are probably going to be fine regardless. They have enough money to play every trend. But the consumer is different. In the United States, the cost of childcare, the cost of health care, cost of a home, cost of groceries have all keep going up. And there are only so many places to get that budget back. And that budget has come back for brands. Big premium brands are being traded down to cheaper brands. Cheaper brands are being traded down to even cheaper brands, like Timu. And we'll talk about that in a second. Cheaper brands, those products are being deferred. Home Depot is had a lot of challenges this year. And the reason is, even if interest rates come down some, are people taking out new debt for a home equity line of credit for a house they're not sure they're going to be in in three years from now? They've been holding and holding and holding. Interest rates are still high. Their budget isn't moving. So will interest rates really help? It's not sure. But what is sure, and this is some uh, Jungle Scout um, a report that was up a quarter or so ago, rising inflation has is, is affected the spending of most consumers across all demographics. Worries about finances affected consumers across all demographics. And household income is a worry and not necessarily stable. And so these things are trends for brands. The merchant has similar but different challenges we'll talk about in a second. But as a what this means is people are buying, looking for more discounts. They're looking for good opening prices. They're also shopping more on marketplaces as a result of this because they know they can get low prices and guarantees that they can't get other places and be sure that the product is going to show up on time for them. 
Social shopping is another trend. If you watch social shopping over the last 10 years, people thought it was going to come to the United States exactly the same way it was China was 10, 15 years ago with Tmall and Singles Day and all those things. But when it came to the US, it really came from our kids. You know, it came up through our kids through TikTok. And if you look at, I like to look at trends that are outliers and using those outlier trends to try and predict like, where is the world going? There are the kings that are gonna stay the kings. Everyone like The Wire, like one of my favorite quotes from The Wire is like, the king stay the king. Um, this is something like this where like Google, Facebook, these guys, they're not going anywhere for a while. Nothing's gonna threaten them. However, there is some asymmetric happy activity happening below the surface with social shopping that you should pay attention to. And I think TikTok shop is the best example of this. If you're not looking at it, if you're not experimenting with it, if you're not understanding what's happening there, if you're not experimenting with their influencer program, which is a built-in affiliate program on a social network to help facilitate commerce, which is the first I've ever seen of that in the industry, then you're not paying attention. There's something also asymmetric about TikTok that none of these other channels, Google, Meta, Amazon, can take advantage of. TikTok is an entertainment platform. And so similar to Google, when they failed to go after social media, like how many times did Google try to create a social media network and failed, like three times? Amazon, Google, Meta, none of these folks are going to succeed making an entertainment platform. Like, let me cut to the chase here. So they're not going to disrupt TikTok. The only one who might disrupt TikTok is our, our, our fine congressman and, and, and perhaps our current or future president whichever side they're on, they all seem to be against each other and for the same things, depending on what day you wake up in the news. But in terms of the consumer, I don't know, I'm just a simple guy, but there's so much money on TikTok and so many people using it and so many, your, your kids and your grandparents and so many consumers using it that the government doesn't usually like to regulate things <laughs> that people love. I don't know if you've noticed that. And so betting against this trend going down and the other way is probably not the best bet because just like the, when there's a big lawsuit in court, what usually happens in a month or two is you find out they settled for some large sum of money that allowed them to stay in business. And that's my guess is what's going to happen here. So if you've been on the sidelines like worrying about like, oh, I don't want to waste all this money on my brand there. First of all, your consumers are there now. So if you're wasting anything, like you're the one standing on the burning platform while your competitors are testing a new channel. So I would encourage you to think about that way. Second is, all those brand assets and things, they work fine on YouTube shorts. What have you wasted? So for me, it's more like nothing ventured, nothing gained. And my, that message should be for those who are sort of still on the fence about TikTok shopping. I would say time maybe to get off the fence. Margin compression. All the brands, I know there are a lot of agencies and software companies in the room, distributors, manufacturers. But the brands as well, margin compression is a real thing. Margin compression comes from in increased manufacturing costs, increased costs of people, increased costs of software, number of the greater number of channels you need to connect to. All these things are super important, and they're not going away anytime soon. As a result, just like consumers are trading down from like premium brands to like maybe mid brands like Target, then they're going down to Walmart, then they're going to Dollar Store, then they're going to Timu. Well, merchants are doing the same thing. They're trading down like that VP you had last year is now the new director. That director you had last year is the new e commerce manager. And so, Companies are adjusting, big and small, by the way. Fewer people, less people, less titles. They're also trading down software and service providers. That software you could afford three years ago, maybe it got too big for its britches and needs a challenger in the market. Just saying. Those things, I think, are makes sense to pay attention to, but why does it matter for you as a merchant? Because it gives you leverage. A lot of these 
providers are running scared. And if you're a merchant, having a software platform or provider with you that's a partner to you that understands your challenges, that's all you're looking for. And so I would say to one side in the room, know that you have leverage, but to the other side of the room in the software companies, know that the brands aren't looking for anything complicated. They're just looking for a partner that understands their situation. And by the way, you should understand their situation because this chart indicates that you're in the exact same situation. And so I was listening to the UPS earning call about three weeks ago, and they were talking about the same shippers who shipped air two years ago, last year were shipping ground. Well, this year they're shipping smart post. And same trade down phenomenon. And a lot of that has to do with Timu, Shein, TikTok, all the injection that's coming in from overseas, which by the way is coming into the US network natively too, because they're starting to recruit US sellers. So margin compression is definitely something that's affecting a lot of businesses here. And just wanted to present some of the data here today. This data is from Channel IQ, one of their recent reports. How does this affect marketplaces and the world that we live in? One of the items that really came out of the research from Rick Kenny and his team is what we call the product feed print, which is the number of places you're in multiplied by the availability, how many products you have, and are they available or not? That combined is your feed print. And feed print is really, that's your footprint in the world of marketplaces. And as a result, that represents really an opportunity to make a sale or an opportunity for someone else to make an impression. And so it's not just about being there because marketplace, it's never, at least not recently, not just about sending a feed anymore. You have to optimize for specific keywords that represent what the consumer is looking for. And in particular, especially early on, if you're a new brand on Marketplace, people on Amazon and Marketplaces are searching for use cases, things that will help them in, the li in their life. 60, 70% of searches on Amazon, just to use one example, are unbranded. You know, I'm looking for cheap toys for my daughter's birthday party. So I, because I have to spend, I have to create 50 toys in a whole ballerina party, and I want to do it for $50. How do I do that? And they go to Amazon, they type in literally these keywords. And so to the extent that you're not just bidding on like, oh, I sell these toys, and that's for these ages, help them with keywords that understand their life. And I think that's really what gets underneath what we're trying to communicate here with the idea of the, of the feed print. So that's exciting to me, and I think as you think about why are we all here, we're all here to grow. But there's like the growth of the last 10, 15 years, which is not coming back. There's no more free money. And we kind of went into a case where after Meta and Twitter cut 50, 60% of their staff, we're also not in the like prof just being profitable is good enough. We're in an age of efficiency now where we're talking about profitable growth. And so you almost have like, think about your investments in terms of what's the return of your investment capital? That's really the growth in your free cash flow. And the more efficient you can be with your invested capital, not just for top line growth, but for growth in your free cash flow, that's really where the action is going to be in the next three years. And I think the, the sooner brands realize that, the better. So 